Hello and welcome to What Would Jane Do? And today I'm joined by Katie McFarlane and my name is Julia Golding and we're going to be talking about what would Jane do about war? Now, unfortunately, this subject was suggested to me by the events in Europe since the beginning of the year with the war in Ukraine. But also in a much pleasanter sense, I've been thinking about it because near where I live, Ridley Scott and his film apparatus turned up onto the Downs to film a massive biopic about Napoleon, uh, which is called Kitbag, starring Joachim Phoenix. So for a whole month, they took over the hilltops with um, their Napoleonic uh, cavalry and all sorts of things, <laughs> which, of course, is you know, right on the brand for Jane Austen. So we thought we'd think about war and Jane's views on it. Now, Katie, I know that as we're looking, the obvious thing is what's sitting behind you. So perhaps we should start talking about um, your connection to the militia. So I will just make it slightly larger so people can see how wonderful it is. Yes, well, this, what you can see behind me now is my husband's uniform. Um, and he's actually part of the regular army. The militia was uh, in Pride and Prejudice, as we all know. Uh, that was formed as as a kind of extra army to uh, uh, look after the, the at home uh, and was largely uh, made up and paid for by uh, the landed gentry and, and uh, uh, the, the upper classes, if you like. And they had their own regiments and often their own uh, fancy costumes as well. Uh, but this uniform behind me here is part of the regular army, uh, which is the 33rd foot. Um, and armies at the time were brigaded. So you'd have two brigades, um, usually about a thousand men in each. One brigade, the, the standard procedure was at the time, one brigade would be at home recruiting and recovering, uh, and the other brigade would be sent off to fight. Uh, that, that was in theory. In practice, in the Napoleonic Wars, what often happened was both brigades were out at the same time, uh, hence the need for militia as well. So the uniform behind me is very typical of uh, the army at the time. As you can see, it's not for camouflage. Uh, the idea is to stand out and look splendid and intimidate the enemy before you even get to them. Also, uh, if you've ever been on a, a battlefield, uh, I, I've been on a reenactment battlefield, which isn't quite the same thing, but close. Um, when all the cannons are firing, uh, you see exactly what they mean by the fog of war. You've got smoke, powder rolling across the battlefield. And I took part in uh, the reenactment of Waterloo in 2015 in Belgium, uh, which was, was amazing to see. Uh, and at one point, the spectators complained because they couldn't actually see what was going on. And they asked the cannons to stop firing because the fog of war was rolling across the battlefield. It was rather ironic. Um, and, and they couldn't actually see. Everybody was swirling around, as they, they tend to, and, and lots of different things happening all over the battlefield. Um, so it really does get uh, important for... Uh, if you're commanding a, uh, a troops, as, as indeed this, this uh, person in this uniform would do, this is Captain McFarland's uh, uh, outfit, um, then, then basically um, you need to see them. <laughs> Not to put too so fine as, a point. So as most people are going to be listening to this, we should actually describe the uniform. I so it, it's yeah. actually a red coat, which would get Lydia's heart pounding oh, yeah. with excitement and it's more than a red coat julia it's a scarlet coat uh, and okay. the difference is the brightness of the dye and the fineness of the wool as well being an officer you were expected to pay for your own uh, coat um, and and you buy your commission uh and basically uh, as a as an ordinary line infantry regiment person you'd have quite a a coarse woolen uh brick red uniform but as an officer you'd have a finer wool you'd have a more expensive wool and for those that can't see um this this uniform actually has a uh, braid um in silver and when i say silver i mean real silver metal so if you touch the braid it's actually very cold to the touch it's metal uh and uh, a metal um epaulette his buckle which is on a, a lovely uh, buff uh, leather uh, crossing his chest uh, and was holding the belt, to, the sword belt together, is pure silver, and it's got the number 33, which is the number of our regiment on it, 
And you can see, uh, this is one for the history buffs who like watching lots of Jane Austen. You can see um, the model is wearing something called a gorget. Now, interestingly, the gorget um, is the last remnant of knightly armor. And it comes from, as you can imagine, uh, if you think about the word gorge, uh, it's to protect your throat as a knight. And what would happen is the knights would take off their uh, all the armor, as you can imagine, after a hard day's battle. But they'd often wander around with the gorget left on, <laughs> just because one of the last things you take off. And over the, the years and the decades, that became a symbol of rank. So when you hear the word gorget, it's to protect your throat. Now, obviously, they don't wear it to protect their throat. They just wear it as a symbol of being on duty. So if you ever see any officers dancing at a ball with a gorget on, because it's lovely and shiny and it's got uh, scarlet ribbon to hold it on in, in nice little uh, rosettes, it looks very pretty. So what costume designers normally say is, oh, let's have him wearing his gorget. Even, uh, but anyone who knows anything about the army knows, well, he's not on duty in the ballroom. So that's that's a, a no-no, history buffs. <laughs> the, other then, the other amazing thing is, is his sash. It's beautiful, and it's it's woven in a particular way. It's called sprang woven, and it takes an absolute uh, a long time, let's shall we say, to, to weave this by hand on, on a, a particular sprang weaving loom. And what it does is it opens out like a net, now, this forms two functions uh, for the officer. It's a badge of rank, obviously. You can see them uh, with their sashes on. But the main thing is if you open it out, you can actually carry an officer off the battlefield in this. It, it opens out into a, a very large net. It also, because it's springy, uh, you can hold your guts in if you get a wound. <laughs> so it's, it's a horrible... Kind of stretcher. Stretcher <laughs> yes. and, and, and bandage. bandage. Yes. Yes, so that there's, no. there's, it looks beautiful, this uniform, but there's actually, surprisingly, a lot of useful uh, parts to it. And, of course, the red coat, which people have sort of mocked as being sort of too obvious, actually yes. did yes. serve a purpose. Um, oh, you yes. mentioned the fog of war, but it was this was a time when most wars were fought more like um, battlefield set pieces, not yes. people crawling through forests it with was, rifles. It was really um, the attitude towards soldiering at the time uh, that was very typical to what we have now, but also some quite contrasting views of it was seen as cowardly to duck if a bullet was coming at you. Um, the fact that the range of the normal musket was about 100 yards meant that you would pretty much be seeing the whites of the other soldiers' eyes as they were firing at you, which is pretty scary stuff. Um, so there was no need, no point really in being camouflaged. You've got to be pretty close up to hit somebody uh, with an ordinary musket. Um, so it was a very different um, mindset um, about what was, uh, you know, uh, suitable for, for warfare. And you were seen as cowardly um, if you didn't stand up and, and basically present yourself to the enemy. Um, it's, it's very strange to our minds now, but if you think about the range of the, the cannon and the muskets and things, particularly the muskets, um, it kind of makes sense, I suppose. And we haven't talked about the bottom half of it. Um, so it's an era <laughs> of breeches, isn't it? Not trousers. Yes, yeah. Um, and indeed, and the... you, you either have sort of stirruped breech, uh, uh, long pantaloons, really. And Richard wears those with his um, with his... Uh, boots, um, or you'd have breeches and stockings. And of course, there's the famous story of uh, all the officers the night before Waterloo going to a, fa a, a fabulous ball. And basically, uh, the the Wellington is notified in the middle of the ball that uh, it's all kicking off. Uh, and he basically uh, calls all the officers together and says, we're going. Uh, and the officers have to say goodbye to their dancing partners and literally with what they're wearing, which was which was very splendid, uh, off duty almost, but but very magnificent uh, dr dance wear as an officer, uh, dashing onto the battlefield in their silk stockings and dancing pumps sometimes, uh, because they just didn't have time to get changed. They were just going straight. They were in Belgium. They were going straight to Waterloo. And I suppose it also makes sense of the stories about people, often women searching the dead after the battle um oh yeah quite grisly stories but if there's oh, yeah. so much 
Silva knocking around on an officer's uniform. Yes. Uh, that would be a, that'd this, be is, this is the uniform of not necessarily the, the highest ranking officer. He's not a general. He's he's a, this this was what a lieutenant or a captain would wear. And what you're looking at, apart from apart from the silver buckle, the silver buttons, uh, and he would have a gold plated uh, 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 cap plate. The silver alone on the lace, as it's called, would be a year's pay for your average soldier. So why the heck would you leave somebody dying in the mud who didn't need his jacket anymore uh, with a year's pay just lying there waiting to be cut off? Yeah, and I think some of the best accounts, it's not of the British Army, but some of the best um, battlefield accounts you can find in War and Peace, um, yes. which covers the, all of the experience of being in the battle and, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the aftermath. And, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic um, account of warfare at the time. So I'd highly recommend, I know it sounds daunting as a novel, but in fact, it's really more <laughs> like a serial. You know, take it in small doses. It's actually very, very uh, informative. Yeah. So let's talk about the politics of the era. When you actually go back and look at the history of the 18th century, you do find that it's a very it's very filled with wars. Not all mm. of them ones we remember. You may, I suppose, have a vague recollection of the War of Jenkins' Ear because it's got such a silly name, uh, which <laughs> happened in the mid-century. But there were lots and lots of wars being fought all over the place pretty much nearly all the time. Pretty uh, much. And and also there's the private army aspect of, um, for example, the East India Company had its own yeah. army and was fighting campaigns during this period. That's where uh, the Duke of Wellington sort of earned his fame as a military yeah. leader. Yeah. But let's take some of the fa more famous ones. So we've got the American Wars of Independence, which are yeah. a sort of very early Jane Austen years. You'd yes. possibly not be aware of it, but it was no. going on. Uh, and then, of course, the big war that came along w was the result of the fallout of the French Revolution. After mm. a bit of a plot here, after they executed the king, um, the oh yes, yeah, shocked, and didn't, didn't you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, 1793 war was declared, and that war carried on with only two short periods of peace until yeah, 1815. very short periods of peace. I think there was the peace of 1803, wasn't there? And then there was a very short peace of 1814. Uh, and then the Hundred Days War after that, where, uh, again, spoiler, Napoleon escaped. And, and uh, amazingly, you have to give it credit. He must have been like the Captain Jack Sparrow of his day. Um, he, he basically uh, lost uh, 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 first time round, got put into exile, escaped and then having come back essentially someone who'd lost he managed to convince a huge amount of soldiers to follow him and try again uh, not many politicians could get away with that these days i don't think he must have had amazing charisma yes and um part of his appeal was that he came up to power through his through military ranks, prowess yeah. it wasn't absolutely originally a politician uh he was a no. military leader that that made good you know more like a julius caesar figure in that yeah. sense and that, in, in uh, that's absolutely why he declared himself emperor i think he very much modeled himself on a young alexander or a julius caesar he definitely saw himself as that type of person and indeed wanted to pretty much conquer the world i mean only only someone with enormous enormous confidence uh, possibly even hubris would, would think of trying to conquer Russia in the winter. So I think we can think of war as endemic in this period. Yeah, absolutely, uh, it, it was, was everywhere. And I think I think um, a lots of people, especially people who, who probably uh, read Jane Austen, would just think of it as something happening in, in Europe and then possibly just in France or Spain. But in fact, if you look at the the politics and the world picture of the time, it was uh, America was using... The, ch the, the chance to invade Canada in 1812 because they saw England was tied up with uh, France. Um, there was battles going on uh, for power in India. Um, obviously, as you said, uh, the East India Company, but but also um, battles for small islands in the West Indies for sugar and, and, and things like that. It was happening absolutely everywhere. Napoleon uh, famously abandoned his army in Egypt. You don't even think of the army going to Egypt, but anywhere that, that was a chance for 
seizing land, uh, strategic ports. Um, the battle was on for power and money, uh, you know, however you could find it. And of course, there was a, a very genuine fear in England at the time, having just had the French Revolution and all this turmoil going on and Napoleon looking more and more of a threat da daily, um, that, they, that we would be invaded and possibly uh, the people would rise up and revolt as well. So it, there was a lot of fear, uh, although like most wars uh, going on all the time, uh, you just have to get on with your daily life. So thinking about war as, an, as a sort of state of you know, normality, mm. uh, I was looking into how much, what percentage of the population was involved in the war effort directly. Mm. Uh, and the army at the time peaked at a quarter of a million, so 250,000 people, mm. which were men, which when you consider the size of the population at the time, many times smaller than ours, current yeah. current levels, it's actually a large percentage of the population. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, huge. Today, our army is, is we, we don't have a huge um, army by world standards, but we have 148,000 people in all of the mm. armed forces. Uh, mm. And I'm talking just about the the army, you know, the boots on the ground people uh, yeah. at the time. So there is a large number of people in the army, but also please let's not forget the Navy, <laughs> because <laughs> this was really um, where Jane Austen's own connection with the war was most yeah. felt. She would um, have known a lot more about the Navy through her family connections than, than the army, I imagine. She would have seen the army about, of course, and especially the militia, because those would have been the ones stationed at home. But definitely she would have had a lot of inside knowledge of the Navy. And I was just um, thinking to myself, as one does, um, how many military people are actually mentioned in Jane Austen? So I did my one of my famous lists uh, and then in, in Persuasion, of course, that is the, the classic yeah, naval the Navy one. Uh, mentioning. Yeah. Um, so you've got Captain Wentworth, Admiral Croft, Captain Benwick and Captain Harvel of the Navy. And I thought, I couldn't think of one immediately in Mansfield Park. And then, of course, I thought, well, of course, William Price, her brother, yeah, uh, Fanny's her brother. brother, who's a midshipman. And then uh, uh, he, he gets a promoted to lieutenant through the intervention of Henry Crawford, um, who uses his influence with his admiral uncle. So he does a good thing, but he does it in a very dodgy way, which is very Henry Crawford. And then Northanger Abbey, we've got obviously General Tilney, the dreaded General Tilney, and the wicked Captain Tilney. Uh, Sense and Sensibility, we of course have the very lovely Colonel Brandon. Uh, and then Pride and Prejudice is just bristling with army people. It's got uh, Lieutenant Wickham, Colonel Fitzwilliam, Captain Denny, and of course Colonel Forster and, and his his regiment. And then I couldn't think of one for Emma until I thought of Colonel Campbell, who Jane Fairfax stays with. So every single novel has got army or navy in it, which shows you, you know, that there was an army influence at the time. Yes, that's, that's very, I, I'm, it's very helpful to have a list, actually. Um, <laughs> you do tend to forget because she do, often has, you know, yeah. her point of view is... is, is a female point of view, but actually mm. you're right, she's surrounded by it. But before we look at the novels, we should spell out to those who don't know so much about her family why she knows a lot about the navy and that's because two of her brothers frank and charles mm. the younger end of the family they both um join the navy and they do incredibly well they are very yes. senior figures by the time mm. um, they retire they survive which you know that's mm. a good thing in war um yeah. frank sits in the family tree sits between cassandra and jane so mm. Um, would have definitely been um, someone that Jane grew up with. He was away from 1789 to about 1794 for a long time on his first voyage. And mm. it shows how um, most of the knowledge is, is the family letters going to and fro. And the first of Jane Austen's letters that survive is from 1796. So we don't see those letters, but we can mm. see that she would have been told through family letters what it was like in the army, uh, in the Navy. Uh, mm. It would have been exciting, scary, no doubt sleepless nights over whether or not they survived. And with good reason, because the accounts absolutely of that first voyage reason. are horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, rats absolutely. that they would, uh, because well, there were so many of them. 
I, I would say that most people in the army or navy at the time got carried off through disease more than battles. Uh, there were big battles, obviously, but disease, uh, especially if you were sent to somewhere like the West Indies or Egypt or India, um, even Holland, there was something horrible um, called, uh, you know, the Wolfen flu, I think, which was pretty much dysentery, um, uh, that carried off a huge swathes of, uh, of the 33rd, which is why they were back recruiting just before the Battle of Waterloo. And the 33rd indeed was sent to India with Wellington um, and were away for 13 years. So you could see why a lot of women followed the army or if they could, if they were allowed to, um, because they wouldn't see their partner for 13 years, possibly never again, uh, especially if their partner couldn't write, uh, which was a possibility. Um, you wouldn't hear from him or very in a very random way. You might not even get sent his pay um, if you were very unlucky. So there were lots of reasons for a woman to join up with her husband, essentially, and, and follow the drum. And Jane, of course, would have seen the, sh the ships down on the south coast when she went down there. Um, the big name a sight to see. Mm. So I think that's why it feels much closer to her, because she... You know, she has a, more visual references for that than seeing the, the militia and the army passing through her city, I think, or her village. Uh, yeah. The Navy is definitely where her heart is, and that, that comes through in the novels. <laughs> okay, so let's think about life in the army just briefly. It was horribly class-ridden, wasn't it, in that... Well, as I was society. You could argue it still is. I think, I think you can sometimes <laughs> um, not get a promotion... Um, based on the fact of who you don't know. <laughs> well, so, I'm, I'm, I'm probably a sweeping generalisation there, but... Uh, but as you were saying, yeah. you had to have a certain amount of money to arrive in yeah. the army. You um, you, but the first thing was you needed someone to buy you a commission. Uh, mm. That's that's the, the, It's a bit like buying a parish for somebody. It's the same sort of thing. Um, second sons, third sons were sponsored to join these professions and the army was a, a classic one so it was a fairly respectable one for for younger hmm. sons yeah yeah and it could, and you know it suited someone who liked riding and wanted adventure uh, and all good of that society. kind of good society yes as as you saw in yeah. the in james novels the uh wellington was actually very insistent that all his officers um presented themselves in in a very sociable way um were respectable and and could dance um uh so so that they could present themselves in, in a very um in a way that was respectable responsible uh it was it was just well known that any officer you know was was brought up with with very good etiquette and I'm still in the army today they teach etiquette to the army because uh if you if you can handle yourself well in society uh you are welcomed everywhere but the lower ranks were not highly regarded at all. I mean, in a sense, you know, cannon fodder and, and Wellington had some very harsh things to say about the people. <laughs> and unfortunately, as with most situations of war, there were atrocities that were committed. So, for example, in the Peninsula campaign, that's the push of the armies up through uh, Portugal and Spain uh, yes. in the Napoleonic Wars. There were some awful behavior on both sides on both sides yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and that's the trouble um well uh, war is never a good thing in, in my in my book <laughs> but it it brings you down to your most base level it wears you down uh you are put in situations where you can't really say what you would do until you face them uh mm -hmm. and it's either brings out the best in people um or it absolutely brings out the worst in people and i don't even call it animalistic behavior because animals wouldn't behave as badly as humans do in times of war uh, yeah. and uh unfortunately yes uh the british army was made up of criminals thieves uh criminals were often given uh, a choice of transportation or join the army um that wasn't to say all of them were like that because that's not true no. um a lot of a large percentage of the army was made up of people um, who couldn't do anything else. Uh, there's a quote that starvation is the best recruiting sergeant. Um, and, and at the time uh, of, uh, you know, the early 1800s, of course, we had the Industrial Revolution coming in. So thousands uh, of people were facing starvation because they're cottage industries. So a lot of the um, 
the northern uh, regiments were made up of uh, loom weavers or laborers who were just out of work thanks to mechanization uh, and yeah the, you, you the, the really really good recruiting uh, thing that a lot of the sergeants um, demonstrated was you got three square meals a day uh, a suit of new clothes uh, and you had ready supply of food, which was an amazing uh, thing to have if you didn't know where your ne next meal was coming on and, and uh, a definite recruiting bonus. And a little sidebar on square meals, that's actually taken from the Navy <laughs> where they had square plates because when they stacked them on the shelves, so you don't want round plates plates because they would roll <laughs> away. They had square ones, so it's associated with good square meals, uh, naval rations. So yes, the army like, and the navy are responsible for so many good sayings that that we just use in in modern parlance today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, another one is of course a, a flash in the pan, which comes from if your musket doesn't go off properly, uh, you just get the pan gets ignited, but the full charge in the musket doesn't doesn't work. And of course, lock, stock, and barrel is that this was the first time that that guns were manufactured uh, with their pieces separately and then all brought together ultimately to form the musket which was lock stock and barrel there we are so everybody's learned a little bit now <laughs> so let's go to the matter which surrounds jane austen which i find yeah. really highly annoying i've got a feeling you might agree with me which is <laughs> the idea that she only writes about sort of little matters in villages um she doesn't deal with this enormous war that's going on sort of wake up <laughs> Why aren't you out complaining about the war? Why aren't you right? Why aren't you being Tolstoy? Um, yeah. So, what's your <laughs> have at? <laughs> have at. I would say uh, she deals with the war as she experienced it. Um, she would have, knowing how well informed her family was, uh, she would have read about it in the newspapers, as, as, as anyone who could read did. She would have discussed it over the dining table. Um, a lot of her characters have uh, military presence going on in their lives. Um, I don't think it was appropriate um, for her to talk about the Napoleon. The Napoleonic Wars had been going on since the 1780s and were still going on uh, when most of her books had been written. Um, it was a presence that everybody accepted in their lives. Um, but I don't think Jane Austen wanted to write about that as she said before let other pens dwell on guilt and misery um that wasn't maybe what she was preoccupied with um her well the preoccupation that comes through to me is the inequality of women um the the difficulties of uh women's roles at the time how little their lives actually were and how dependent on men and the fortunes of others possibly um, I think there's enough going on in Jane Austen's books, very serious, um, desperate sometimes uh, issues without bringing war into it. There's enough heavy themes. If you read the subtext, I think the people who only think it's all about tea parties and, and people swanning around in gardens and dances aren't reading the underlying subtext of a lot of what's going on. That's my view. Yeah, and I think she does do it as well. I think she does deal with it. So... Um, I think she does the Derry Girls before the Derry Girls. So yeah. if you've watched that series, the troubles are treated as, oh gosh, that this bridge has been blown up. I'm not going to be able to get to my prom. That mm. is Lydia Bennett saying, oh mm. wow, the fisher in town. Uh, I have high excitement. I can go. I can go and dance at the at the uh, down in Brighton. Yes, the, mil the uh, military are, are basically in her village in case of French invasion. That's yeah. what the military are doing. But as far as Lydia Bennett's concerned, the military are there solely to entertain her. Yeah. <laughs> and that teenage um, self-absorption is yeah. hilarious. So if yeah, you just think how you feel about the Derry Girls, which is dealing with a very serious subject of the Troubles, mm. the Troubles mm. are barely mentioned. They're the same. Well, they are mentioned, but they're mentioned to see how is it, what does it feel like to live through it as somebody living in that perspective? Um, mm. And that's what Jane Austen is doing in Pride and Prejudice, brilliantly. Uh, yes. Also, I think she does actually, in Mansfield Park and Persuasion, actually deal more seriously with mm. the experience of war. So 
Um, William Price is finding it really hard to get on. She's looking at the the way the Navy works under yeah. these conditions, how even good people are held back because of failure for having any sort of patronage. So she is looking at these. Yeah. And, she's, and, yeah. and obviously yeah. Fanny is always worried about her brother, the sense of concern for what's happening to mem family members abroad. And then Absolutely. next, and next book. Yes, yeah, I mean, the whole point of Captain Wentworth not being able to marry the love of his life because he hasn't captured enough ships yet. You know, he hasn't got the prize money and he basically has to wait and goodness knows for how long until he comes across one. It, it, the, you know, prize ships didn't fall into your lap necessarily. And as he says, there was a very telling commentary about how bad, um, you know, the, 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 the Navy uh, delights in sending it's promising uh, uh, captains to, to see in unseaworthy vessels. You know, that, that's a, common, yeah. a, a telling commentary on the state of the Navy. Uh, and it's very interesting at the time that the government basically condoned piracy effectively mm -hmm. because the Navy, uh, if you, if you uh, it said, fine, go out, capture any French ship that you come across. It's a, it's a prize of war. Uh, and, and they did. Uh, and basically you could... Uh, get thousands of pounds very quickly as an officer as as a, a, a an able seaman you probably wouldn't get very much to our eyes but actually considering they weren't paid very much to begin with it was there was still probably a sig significant amount of prize money to be had but it could change lives if you managed to capture uh, a rich cargo uh, and if nothing else the fact that the navy the british navy were going out there and capturing ships uh, and basically sailing them away to be broken down uh, for, for money uh, meant that if the French had any really valuable cargoes, they had to take out other ships to accompany those cargoes wherever they were going. So it tied up a lot of ships that otherwise would have fought the British. So it's a very good strategy if you think of it that way. Yes, and if you want to sort of find a more fuller detail about that, the Patrick O'Brien books are very good oh, on yeah. that. And the Hornblower series, the C.S. Yeah. Forrester. Uh, and but they didn't just um, break down the ships; they often just um, put them under a name. <laughs> and and under behold, a they were flag. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's also um, a very unusual uh, twist in persuasion, which perhaps people um, don't think about too much, which is the fact that it's an exploration of the role of the wives of senior officers. Um, so. Um, Admiral course, Croft and Mrs. Croft yes. uh, talk, talk about, talks about you know going with going yeah. with each other and, and and she said the only time I was very depressed was when I I was uh, you know in Ireland waiting for him to traverse the North Sea and I wasn't allowed to go with him and, and that actually depressed me but you'd have to think uh, and you'd have to weigh up as a military person or as a naval person um, whether it was safe enough to take your family to take your wife with you and only really the upper echelons could afford to do so. Um, it, as an ordinary woman following the drum, I was allowed to follow the army as long as I was useful. So I would have been doing the laundry. I would have, been, ha, have about 10 soldiers that were mine and I would be um, doing the washing, which is the one thing they probably didn't have time to do. All the soldiers could cook, all the soldiers um, could sew. So that wasn't so necessary. Um, but they had about 10 women, if that, per hundred uh, were allowed to come along to do the laundry and, and be on the strength as it was known. And going back to this, the the sea on the naval side mm. of it, I think there's also a yeah. mention of Captain Harville's family being brought to him by yes, Captain And then at it's the very end, how he talks about waiting for his family to be, yeah. you know, to be joined with him again. And you would have to um, go to the hopefully the nearest uh, uh, port that you thought they might land at. He could land at Liverpool. He could land at Portsmouth. And you imagine traveling across England to meet your, your partner with all your children. Uh, it would have been a very expensive undertaking. And if you hadn't seen them for months or even years. And the one thing that's notable about the Navy, of course, is that they would be returning to England on a regular basis, unlike the Army, which could stay away for years, um, to refit the ships, if nothing else, and take on the fresh supplies. Though, as we saw from uh, Jane's brother, it could actually be years. It could be um, years, I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in fact, that that continues well into the 20th century. I, I'm it not does, sure what the situation yeah. is now, but my grandfather was away for several years on a tour mm. before the 
Second World War uh, in the Far East, as it was called then. And, you know, goodbye, wife. <laughs> See you yeah, in a couple absolutely. of years. That was the naval way. It's a very odd, if you think of it in terms of um, a partnership, it's a very difficult partnership to have as a spouse on, on either side, I would say, because you have years of being your own person, uh, answering to yourself, being totally independent, being a single person effectively. And then when somebody comes back, uh, and if they're with the army or the navy, they've probably got very uh, regimented ways of doing things, uh, definite ways of doing things. And you have to suddenly become a couple again. And I think that must have been incredibly hard, well, still is, on, on army or navy wives and, and, and husbands indeed. Uh, it's and, then, and they also have to kind of come out of that military way of being where everything's prescribed and dictated to you and you have very set ways of doing things to civilian life and that's a very tough adjustment I think for most people. I think Anne Elliott one of the sort of subtexts of Anne Elliott's story in Persuasion is the preparation of the perfect naval wife because her <laughs> none know, so capable as Anne. None so capable and also when you compare her to Louisa Musgrave, oh, yeah. the more romantic sort. Mm -hmm. um, what was he thinking? You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was very susceptible, there. having been at sea for so long. Really, <laughs> he was ready to fall in love with the first girl that uh, gave him the eye. Exactly, that's what Admiral Croft says, isn't it? Um, and in anyway, fact, so... you think about it, a lot of uh, sorry, a lot of seamen um, were at sea for months, uh, not necessarily years. They would put into port occasionally, but when they did put into port, they you know basically went crazy because they had been away from society away from enjoyment away from good food good good companionship um so they'd you know pop into the nearest port with silver buckles on their knee uh, and spread their cash around they hadn't been able to spend it on anything for ages so they would go absolutely nuts when they came into port <laughs> yeah so there's one thing which um we haven't mentioned yet which is the press gang um, because, Aha, I'm glad you yeah. mentioned that, Junior. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. do carry on. Well, because um, certainly it was a high risk um, place to be in the Navy as opposed to being a merchant seaman. Um, conditions were slightly better as a merchant seaman. You went under yeah. quite the same discipline and you weren't going into battle with the cannons roaring. No. So in order to keep recruits, they sent recruiting parties into ports to bring people forcibly abroad. Um, I did actually write about this in one of my books. Um, as I've got a book series for children called the Cat Royal series. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah. yeah and not in just the, the children, Julia. <laughs> They're friendly who likes history. <laughs> there is uh, Cat and Nine Tales, which is obviously yeah. a reference to the whip. Uh, it starts with a um, recruiting party, shall we say, a forcible recruiting party. Um, and well, I know you will have done your research into this. So how often did press gangs actually operate, would you say? Not as often as you <laughs> think. And also they were under strict rules. They were breaking, in my book, yes. they're breaking the rules because yes. there's an evil plot to get hold of it's somebody. Dramatic. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, but it, you, it was supposed only to take people who were already seafaring, who knew what they were doing. Um, and it was only under certain conditions, but it still makes a great story. So, yeah. It makes a great story. Yes, I can yeah. vouch for that. But because my, um, one of my myth busting things about uh, people say, oh, yes, uh, all the entire Navy was made up of people who were press gang. Uh, I have friends in the uh, HMS, which is known as the Historical Maritime Society, and they do the naval period in not just Regency times, but, but lots of different periods. Uh, and they always um, get very irate when people mention press gangs, because they say, how on earth, you know, it, it, we, we were sailing past on a, a barge one day down the Thames, um, uh, and we were passing a, um, a pub called The Bunch of Grapes. And there was this, uh, this person giving a narration on the barge as they do, about various sites to be seen from, from the water. And he said, ah, oh, the Bunch of Grapes, a well-known press gang uh, pub. And I said, yes, you definitely hang out in a pub that had press <laughs> gangs with us every day. And you could just see HMS bristling, ready to pull their cutlasses out and, 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 and keel haul this chap. And they said, you know, who is the worst possible person you want on board with you? Somebody who's been press ganged, who doesn't want to be there, is not very competent, 
is liable to desert ship at the first minute you put into port. No, you want somebody experienced who knows what they're doing, is happy to be there. And it's under enormous pressure at sea anyway. You have to work as a team. Uh, you're, you're effectively a little town on a ship. Um, so somebody who didn't want to be there and had been forcibly put there, as you say, it would have been under, uh, under strict regulation and only in desperate times when you didn't have enough uh, sailors. But otherwise, no, the, the, that would have been a terrible way to recruit people. <laughs> yes, it, 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 but it did happen. Um, it did. Yeah. yeah, and so, for example, there was a famous black violinist who was press ganged aboard and wasn't allowed to land because they feared he'd run off. <laughs> um, but he's, if you read about the presence of black people in uh, the late 18th century, he comes up because he has a happy ending. He goes and um, becomes a music teacher in the Southwest and marries the local lass. But for a few <laughs> years, he was part of this system where he wasn't allowed to mm. uh, escape. <laughs> right. So, um, so we're both arguing it, it, we're in agreement with each other that um, what Jane Austen is doing is is talking about a war that's endemic so it's part of her life Every, um, all her readers would have known there was a war yeah. going on and it would have been yeah obviously of course there's yeah. a war going on that's what's, that's just life isn't it yeah she's not so writing she have been uh, taking the blooming obvious she not the blooming obvious does she are Jane <laughs> Um, but she is reflecting on it uh, in in both, all of her novels. There is a presence of the war, but uh, in more specifically in Pride and Prejudice, uh, Mansfield Park and Persuasion. If you really want to, you know, follow this this thread. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's think about bringing things to the current era. I suppose it's fairly obvious. What would Jane Austen think about the wars carrying on at the the current time? Um, do you think she would? consider them matters for her pen i find it i think she would have focused in on the human toll uh definitely she would have focused on on how it affected people's character as i said you have extremes of behavior in wartime and i think it's very interesting when to me when people get very nostalgic about the past uh think about for example the amount of wartime experience festivals there are. And you think, hang on a minute, why, why on earth would anyone uh, want to celebrate war? And it's not celebrating war. And indeed, what I do isn't celebrating war. I just want to make that absolutely clear. I don't think anyone you speak to celebrates people getting slaughtered. Um, what, what it's about is the nostalgia for what often happens in wartime, which is communities working together, um, extremes of it of intensive experience and a lot of soldiers experience this when they come back from warfare is suddenly their lives are meaningless or what they've been trained for doesn't exist anymore um, they experience intense camaraderie intense um, excitement and, and there's a saying of you know war is 90% uh, boredom and 10% terror uh, but I think in the the army of the regency times uh, and I'm sure it still holds true today you bond very closely with your with your comrades. Um, you all work together as a team. You have set rules, so so in a sense, uh, your life is is dictated to you. So you have the safety of rules, if you like. Um, yes, there are times when everything spins out of control and horrible things happen, but the majority of your time is spent in quite a, a comforting way. In a way, is that you have set rules to prescribe to. You have set meals. You have a, a strategy around you to dictate your life and it's that's quite comforting in that so i think the nostalgia that people feel is not for war as such but it's for the some of the good things that arise out of war um, which, which is a bonding um, a, a sense of communal purpose a sense of pulling together to achieve something um, and and for me i uh, reenact to celebrate the human spirit if you like and I, I know that sounds a bit corny uh, but especially for women um, they're not celebrated enough all the amazing things that they did and um, I've got here which I'm going to promote now um, this book called Catherine Exley's Diary the life and times of an army wife in the Peninsula War and this is one of the very very few accounts of uh, an ordinary woman 
basically going through extraordinary times, horrific, you know, children dying, climbing the Pyrenees barefoot and things like that. Um, but what she went through and survived is absolutely incredible. And you tell that to people today and they would just probably just lie down and die. They wouldn't be able to cope with the amount of stress and pressure and just sheer gutsiness it took to get through um, extraordinary times. But in and amongst that, there are nice things. There are people who help her, um, people who give her money, um, see her through when she loses her husband and then finds him again. And oh, it's, it's a, it's, it would make an amazing film. Uh, but this was an ordinary woman's life at the time. And I think if you talk to any veteran, especially today, some of the stories they come out with are so incredible. You think, how could one person cope with this, experience this, get through this? And that's what I want to remember is that even in the worst of times, you can have the best um, of people um, getting through them and surviving and triumphing sometimes. I think the other thing that... Um reminded me of is of course Jane Austen's family welcomed um, their cousin Eliza de mm. Fuila yeah. uh, as an exile, a refugee um, mm. from the French Revolution so I feel that she would have great compassion and possibly open up the house um, for the people fleeing from the Ukrainian um, yes. conflict yes. or Afghanistan obviously from last summer mm. so mm. I think that she would be engaged but I, I think she also would have she's like i'm a novelist i don't feel i can write a novel about the war in ukraine and so future people say why didn't she write about that it's because <laughs> i don't I know i'm not qualified yeah. um, no exactly hmm. you know i think I like that 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 not, you know. yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah you write what you know and you write what you know because you can empathize with that more you can give a, a stronger viewpoint you can try and imagine stuff as a writer. And, mm -hmm. and as you said, you do your research to give yourself a sense of what, what's going on in, in the past and things like that. But I'm well aware um, as a reenactor, there is no way I am as fit or um, as badly nourished or, you know, I haven't gone through any of the, the real trauma that, that people would have gone through then. And even then, I, I still get sort of rheumatics when I'm in a tent for in, in damp weather for too long and things like that. So well, for I think me, they got all of that, a, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. They, oh gosh. Well, you were worn out. I mean, there was an actual um, condition of being worn out as a reason for leaving the army because your body just physically couldn't cope with the amount of um, torture, practically. Um, the, the, just the sheer slog of marching, never mind being fired at, of sleeping under hedges, of being caught in a downpour and your clothes being wet for days and, th and things like that. You were just literally physically worn out at about 40 uh, in, a, in a lot of cases. So there were veterans, um, but they it was amazingly lucky to, to get through the, the amount of uh, physical hardship they had to endure in those days. So I'm, I'm full of admiration for anyone um, who, who survived that really. But then life was tough everywhere in those days. As I said, you were starving. If you didn't not if you didn't join the army, you could end up in the poorhouse, which nobody wanted to happen. At least in the army, you had a, a, literally a fighting chance. Thank you, Kate. I think we've covered the ground um, quite comprehensively there. So before we finish, I just wanted to ask you if you have any Jane Austen related news to share yes, with listeners. I do, as a matter of fact, dear listeners. Um, yes, uh, we've got the Jane Austen Literary Foundation, which I'm uh, a big fan of. Uh, run by Caroline Knight, who, of course, is Jane Austen's great, 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 something great niece. Uh, and uh, she's one of the founder members. There's a picnic in the grounds of Chawton House on Sunday, the 19th of June at 2 p.m. That's Alton in Hampshire. So you can buy 20, uh, for a £25 ticket. It includes a picnic box, homemade lemonade and entertainment. Uh, and I think there's, there's various lectures and, and games and things going on. So that sounds a lot of fun. Also, at the same time, you can help choose the winner of the writing competition run by the Jane Austen Literary Foundation. So read three Jane Austen inspired short stories and vote for your favourite before the 18th of June. Uh, judges include Susanna Harker, who, of course, was Jane in the 1995 TV programme, and Helena Kelly, author of Jane Austen, The Secret Radical. Uh, so go to the Jane Austen Literary Foundation, uh, look at it online. Uh, writing competition to find the link and the winners get put into an audiobook so that's fun and uh, should there be any rumblings uh, the Jane Austen festival in Bath in September is definitely going ahead uh, I know one of the organizers and I will be there so if you dare speak to me in person 
uh, I will be happy to speak to you. And, and uh, the, this beautiful uniform behind me is one of many that will be on display on actual real life militia. So do come and see us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.